speaker for today's event is P uh, Peter, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, Peter Kagayama, who is with Creative Cities Productions. Peter is the co-founder and producer of the Creative City Summit, an interdisciplinary event that brings together practitioners around the big idea of the city. The next Creative uh, Cities Summit is going to be coming up, and you might want to look that up for more information. Peter travels the world speaking about issues of local community development, talent attraction, and retention of creative industries. Peter is also one of the founders of the Sarasota International Design Summit presented by the Ringling College of Art and Design. He's been the show's co-producer and the host and moderator since 2007. He's the past president of Creative Tampa Bay, a grassroots not-for-profit organization championing the creative economy in the Tampa Bay area. Between 2007 and 2009, he organized and led groups of community leaders from Northern Ireland on their learning tours of the United States looking at creative cities and an innovative community development projects in Washington, D.C., Chicago, Baltimore, Austin, Memphis, and Tampa Bay. He holds his bachelor's degree from Ohio State University and a law degree from Case Western Reserve University. Peter has a brand new book out that he's going to be talking today titled For the Love of Cities, and we're looking forward to hearing more from Peter as we go throughout today's session. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Peter. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. Perfect. I think we're up. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be uh, speaking with you today. Um, this is kind of a new uh, thing for me. I've not done too many of these webinars like this. I'm used to actually being able to make eye contact with people, so if my jokes run a little flat, I apologize for that ahead of time. Um, I just wanted to say thank you very much to the Ohio State University, for uh, Jennifer, uh, for the, uh, the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association. Uh, for having me here today as a, as a native of Akron, Ohio, and somebody who went to Ohio State, it's actually always kind of fun to uh, uh, come back and do something uh, related to the American University. So thanks for that. Uh, as you can see on my screen, this is me. It's always good to put a, uh, a face with a name. And uh, today we're going to talk uh, about uh, this little uh, book I've written called For the Love of Cities. Peter, I'm just going to interrupt for a second, and uh, we've got some folks that are asking you to speak up so they can hear you more clearly. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I will put on my best presentation voice and enunciate to the back room. Um, as I said, this uh, book, I've written about lovable cities. Um, I've been traveling around uh, the country and around the world talking with people um, who are passionately engaged with their cities, and I'm trying to understand what is the common thread. What is it that makes people do extraordinary things uh, for their cities? And I've found some great stories. I've uh, found some great examples here, and I've tried to put that into uh, this particular book that hopefully inspires other people to go out and do some amazing things. Um, and speaking of inspiration, the genesis of this conversation actually started about six years ago when I happened to be in Toronto. I was working with a gentleman named Charles Landry, who's the founder of the Creative City Movement. And he was speaking in Toronto. And we're in the, uh, the grand uh, 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 city hall there where it seats several hundred people. And uh, Mayor David Miller gets up and does his uh, welcome. And then uh, he brings up this particular gentleman whose name is Giorgio De Chico. And at the time, Giorgio was the poet laureate of the city of Toronto. And instead of speaking uh, a poem, he said he would speak poetically instead. And what he talked about was something that was so fundamental um, and so uh, interesting, but I was struck by the fact that I had not really heard it before. He talked about love. He talked about the, this idea of what makes a city fall in love with itself. And at the time, he was talking about arts and culture. But he intoned this idea that we have this emotional relationship with our city that I had not heard before. I mean, of course, we have the, you know, a dialogue about making better cities, more creative cities, and things like that. But love, something as fundamental to our human nature, was missing. And I found that very, very interesting. So that was, I think, the idea of the book maybe began there even before I knew there was a book uh, in the offing. Now, why is this interesting and why is this important? Well, it kind of comes down to uh, something that the Gallup uh, organization in conjunction with the Knight Foundation discovered when they did this Soul of the Community survey, which was a three-year project uh, that they did from 2008 through 2010. And it tried to determine sort of what is the state of our relationship with our cities. 
And sadly, uh, the results were not particularly good. What they found is that 40% of us say we are unattached to our communities, 36% of us are neutral, and just 24% of us are, quote, attached. Now, how did we get to this particular sorry state? And how, perhaps, are our, our planning decisions, how are uh, the things that we do as a profession, um, how are they maybe culpable in arriving at this particular uh, state? So let's look at this. And since we are a, uh, a highly educated planning group, I thought, let's go back a little bit. Let's look at what seemed like good ideas at the time, but obviously we know have had bad, bad uh, implications. We go back to the Federal Housing Act of 1949. Cabrini Green is a good example here. Uh, Pruitt Igo uh, in St. Louis. Uh, again, at the time we thought this was the way uh, to deal with poverty and affordable housing. Pruitt Igo was so bad they had to tear it down less than 20 years after it had actually been built. The Federal Highway Act of 1956. Well, men like Robert Moses used that act to cleave neighborhoods in two, all in greater service to the car. Now, clearly, there are huge benefits to actually the, the interstate highway system. I'm not denying that. But there were externalities, and there were factors that happened to our cities that we really didn't plan on, and we didn't think um, would, would result in maybe the situation that we're in today. And part of that, that now is this idea of the suburbs and sprawl. And look where you know this is, uh, has taken us. We, are, we have created communities that live in service to the car. And all of you know that our cars essentially act as prophylactics against uh, us having any sort of meaningful contact and meaningful interaction with our, our fellow citizens. And in greater service to the car, we've created things like uh, parking decks that, of course, you know, become central to any uh, planning and development issues because we always have to make room for the bloody cars. And of course, the, the result here is strip malls and things like this, places that are not really worthy uh, of our love. And in fact, James Kunstler, who many of you have probably heard of, who wrote uh, several books, including his best-known one, The Geography of Nowhere, he said that the public realm is the physical manifestation of the common good. But fundamentally, he said that we've created places not worth caring about. Now, that's a very sad state. So how do we change that? How do we move uh, from you know, living in uh, these types of, of environments, the places that actually inspire us, the places that actually make us want to have an emotional connection. We can do better. And just as a quick example, this happens to be a, uh, the first LEED certified parking structure in Santa Monica. It's attached to their Civic Center, and it opened in 2008. And I thought, you know, that's actually a pretty cool parking deck. That's actually a parking deck that people might say, that's kind of cool, that's lovable, and, and things like that. So it's not that it can't be done. I think we haven't been challenged. I think we haven't been inspired enough to maybe move forward in this uh, direction uh, as purposefully as we should. So let's talk about this idea, why lovable cities matter. Now, it goes back to this Gallup Soul of the Community survey. And what they found uh, from 2002 to 2006 is that the most attached communities had the highest local GDP growth. And they found a significant relationship between how passionate and loyal people are to their communities and local economic growth. Is it causal? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not, uh, I didn't do the, that particular research. And I, I would suspect that it's probably not causal. But it's certainly related enough that it should be something that we take notice of. And the impact uh, of this, I think, was, was quite profound. It actually put some numbers and put some data behind this notion uh, this idea that you know loving something actually matters, and the, the best example I can use of this, you know, does does love really matter? Well, you know, certainly when children are loved, they thrive. So too when plants or pets or even objects. I mean, just look at this particular car. I mean, it's clear that this is a car that is uh, that somebody who loves cars owns this particular car. Now, most of our cars probably look more like this. I said I know mine certainly does, and if you're in Ohio. Or up north, I'm sure your car probably looks like this right now, too, covered in salt and things like that. Now, that's not to say this car hasn't been maybe well taken care of in the sense that it's been serviced regularly, it does the job, it gets you from point A to point B, but there's clearly a difference in the way this car looks and feels versus, again, that's a car, that's an object that is loved. Now, what would the, the manifestation of our city, if it is loved in, simil in a similar way, what would that look like? So what we're really talking about here is this idea of creating sustainable, level, lovable communities. And that's a set of conditions that creates more emotional engagement, uh, that creates more lovers of cities. How do we motivate these people who are in love with, uh, with that? And it taps into something that is beyond pure economics. And I think if we can do this, if we can add uh, a bit of the human heart to our uh, toolkit for city making, I think we make much better cities. And I think we create in, in incredible places. And I don't think it costs a lot of money. So we'll get to that. But I'm excited about these, uh, these ideas. 
Now, one thing that as planners and, and as city developers, economic developers, everyone's been talking about this for a number of years, this idea of becoming an amenity-rich city. And certainly, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a powerful lure for, for business, for talent, and things like that. Uh, but the problem I find with this uh, idea of playing this amenity game is that there are very few winners, and most of us are actually losers. Because inevitably, when we play the amenity game, we are comparing ourselves to other places that, uh, that almost always have more. Um, you're comparing yourselves to the Chicago's, the New York's, the Seattle's, San Francisco's, the uh, you know the star cities, if it were. And that's hard to do if you're a Cleveland or a Detroit or a Milwaukee or smaller places like you know in Akron, Ohio. You can't do it. You lose by playing that game. Now, what I'm suggesting is that if we play a different game and we look at meaning, not just amenities, but meaning, where your uh, impact on your community is tangible, where it feels like you make a difference, that is incredibly powerful, especially to uh, the number of people who are, I call them sort of purpose-driven people, the ones who want to feel like their contribution makes a difference in their community. That's not everybody, but it's certainly enough people that this is a way for cities to maybe look at uh, attracting a, a slightly different type of talent than they have maybe historically looked in the past. Now, pardon, oops, pardon me. All right, so what we're talking about here is meaning rich. And when I'm talking about more than amenities, uh, cities that are open, cities that are democratic, that feel like they're accessible to your imprint, that feel like you can make a difference. Now, it's not just about uh, consuming a city. Now, and we all consume cities. I'm not going to, to deny that. But the way most of us uh, you know, uh, think about our cities is that we consume them in the sense that we pay our taxes, we obey the law, and the city provides the needed infrastructure for us. And that's fine. Um, but some of us look for more out of our cities. We're looking for, again, that, uh, that, that ability to make a difference, the ability to make an imprint, and maybe even to be challenged uh, by our cities. You know, cities that need us, there's something kind of interesting uh, about that. All right. Now, in this continuum of engagement, I wanted to look at this, these numbers. 40% are unattached, 36% are, neut are neutral, 24% are attached. Well, I don't think that tells sort of the complete story because I think there's a lot that's hidden within those big categories. So I've created what I call this continuum of engagement. And it looks at the idea that you know not everybody who is uh, disengaged uh, is hostile to the city. In fact, most of them are probably not. Most of them are probably sort of bored. Uh, with their city, you know, and, and even within the neutral category, there's people who are leaning one way or another, maybe a little bit, maybe towards more being curious, more bored, whatever. And then within that engaged sector, there are a few people at the far end of the spectrum who are very much in love with their community. Now, why I think this is important is because out here at this particular end, I think these are the people who make things happen. That's not to say it's exclusive. You can't. I'm not saying that you can't be bored or detached from your community and create something of value. Uh, for the community or do something that's, that's cool and engaging and things like that. I'm just saying it's far more likely that it's going to happen by this particular group uh, out here at this end. Now, the people who are in love with their cities, I've called them co-creators because in a sense they are co-creating the city that the rest of us consume. They are making the content uh, that the rest of us sort of take in. Um, and this is my friend Bob Devin Jones. Bob is the creative director of a small community arts program here in, the, in St. Petersburg. Uh, I, I'm based in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, called the Studio at 620. And Bob is sort of the archetype of this idea of the co-creator. Um, now, he is a central node in the network that makes up St. Petersburg. But he doesn't show up on any official sort of org chart of the city. Um, but he's an incredible resource. He's on boards. He's making things happen. He is a connector of people. And I submit that if we lost Bob Devin Jones, we lose far more than one particular person. But again, he doesn't show up on the typical... Uh, map that, that makes up you know, who we think of as making cities. Here are some other people that are in love with their city. On the, on the left uh, is Phil Cooley from Detroit. On the right, Claire Nelson, also from Detroit. Phil is a young guy. He uh, uh, bought a building in the Corktown neighborhood of Detroit, rehabbed it into the hottest restaurant in the, in the city. Um, Claire opened up a little design shop, um, sort of a uh, What's it? A uh, crate and barrel type store uh, in the Woodward area uh, of uh, the city. And they are champions of the city, not because they're doing something extraordinary, but sort of where they're doing it and sort of how they're doing it. Um, these people are absolutely in love with their city, and they do things above and beyond uh, uh, 
what we typically think of retailers or restaurateurs. This is my friend Robert Fogarty. Robert runs a, a not-for-profit in New Orleans called Evacuteer. Well, in order to fund Evacuteer, which uh, trains people on how to evacuate the city in the case of another uh, hurricane or an emergency, um, he created this photography concept called Dear New Orleans. And you might have seen some of these photos. He's gotten a lot of attention uh, nationally about this, where it's a photography service where they bring people in at an event, and they write these messages to the city on their hands in sort of a non-permanent marker. And this is a good example. And he's actually expanding this to other cities, and he's even rolling out Dear World uh, this year, which I think is pretty exciting. And again, he's one of those people who's absolutely in love with his city, and it manifests in what he does. Now, Within this, um, there's an idea here about the 1% rule. And some of you may have heard this in the context of the internet. Um, it's also called a power law hey, distribution. Hey, Peter, system. I'm going to ask you to pause for a second. It sounds like. I'm getting feedback. Yes. Is that your speaker? Hello? I'm not saying anything at the moment. Okay, Peter, go ahead and try again. Try again. Okay. All right, I can still hear something a little bit in the background. But is it, or does that sound okay to you, Jennifer? Jennifer, are we okay? Hello? Jennifer? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. All right, I'm going to continue. All right, so this 1% rule, and again, it's, a, it's the, called a power law distribution by statisticians or participation inequality uh, by demographers. But the best example I can think about this is, the, is Wikipedia. I'm sure almost everyone in our audience has used Wikipedia at some point or another. It's a, it's a great resource. And I'm imagining that some people in our audience, a few, have probably even made a Wikipedia entry. And there might be one or two folks out there in the several hundred that are on the call who maybe made five or ten or even many more Wikipedia entries. But the point is, is that the actual number of people who make Wikipedia entries is very, very small. In fact, it's less than 1%. So what you can say is that of all of the, the content that is Wikipedia, less than 1% of the total users of Wikipedia actually built Wikipedia. Now that's a fascinating statistic because I think that actually applies to physical communities as well. So if you think about who actually is making the cities that we live in. It's a relatively small number uh, of official actors, certainly, but there are other people out there, like the Bob Devin Joneses and the Robert Jones and the Claire Nelsons of the world, who are part of this co-creative sphere. That are actually hey, Peter, I I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but I think there's somebody who's on the on that has not gotten themselves muted, and I can't figure out who it is. So if everybody can make sure that you're muted, then that will prevent the feedback that we're hearing. I'm hearing an echo there when you did that, so. Okay. We shall carry on, the vagaries of technology notwithstanding. So, um, But I want us to start thinking about these co-creators as a natural community resource. Um, because these types of people who are going to do extraordinary things for cities, and oftentimes, you know, they're not being paid for this. This maybe is not part of their official job, but the manifestation of their, their emotional connection to their city uh, creates these incredible uh, projects, incredible opportunities, creates these very lovable elements that the rest of us sort of naturally gravitate to. So I want us to think about co-creators as a natural community resource. Now, if you think about who makes the community, I go back to this point, um, we have the typical sort of idea about uh, who makes it, government, business, the faith-based sector, and the nonprofit sector. The problem is, is that as uh, resources have dwindled, and they've dwindled in every particular group, the gap between the city we desire and the city we can afford is getting bigger and bigger. Now, into this breach, where are we going to see? It's going to be these unofficial players, these unofficial actors who are going to hopefully be able to step up and do some of the things uh, that, that close the gap and makes those cities, makes our cities um, particularly lovable. And again, I think that in this particular area, the, the co-creators are absolutely key uh, to this particular uh, section. And I've got a pretty cool example of this. This actually comes from my friend Sean Mann in Detroit. And Sean lives in one of the neighborhoods in western Detroit. And what he's been able to do, and I'm hearing somebody typing right now. So if you're typing, you're, you're the one who didn't mute your, your, uh, your thing. So anyways, hopefully we'll get that squared away. Um, the unofficial actors uh, sort of idea here, uh, Sean and his friends see 
uh, parts of their neighborhood are people are abandoning homes and things like that. And rather than just let them completely go to seed into the, the scrappers and whatnot, what they do is they come in and they will mow the lawns and they will actually paint, the, you know, cover the windows with these plywood things and then paint them. Something simple, but the whole idea here is to create uh, the sense that, hey, look, somebody actually cares about this. Somebody's watching that the neighborhood, we're not going to let it completely fall uh, to see the things like that. They, they're not paid for this, but it's in their sort of own interest. Here's a good, another great example. Right near his own neighborhood, there was this old viaduct. And obviously, this is a typical rundown viaduct. It's a, it's a magnet for graffiti and things like that. But what these guys did is they brought in their own uh, forklift. They, uh, they closed off the street themselves. And this is the result. They did not have permission, certainly, to do this. Uh, but certainly, the, the citizens of Detroit uh, benefited from that. Now, I know as, as planners, it's hard to walk that line between sort of the Hello? I'm getting lots of feedback, Jennifer. Yeah, I hear that. Somebody. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna continue then. Okay. All right. So these unofficial actors are, are becoming a, a resource. But how do you marshal these particular folks? Because I'm saying I don't think that the playbook for how to do this is you know has been written. It's being written right now. But I think at least if we know about these challenges, maybe we can be, be in a better position to sort of work with these folks and not work at cross purposes and things like that. Because at heart, these people want to make their cities better. Now, what's the role of planners um, in this? Now, obviously, the role of planners is about marshalling resources for the greater good and the development of the community. Uh, the problem is, is that your toolbox has been now emptied and is more limited, um, and you've got a bunch of these funky new things to consider. Um, so I want you to think about this. I'm sure no one has ever thought of you or your, yourselves as being sort of a cupid uh, in this, in the, this idea of creating lovable cities, because you're not going to go out and shoot love arrows into your citizens in the local park. So what are you actually going to be able to do? Well, it kind of comes back to this idea from the soul of the community. They found three magic ingredients uh, for uh, creating emotional engagement with their places. Aesthetics of a place, the social offerings of a place, which is obviously things to do, and openness, which is a measure of tolerance and acceptance. Hello? Are we back? OK. Um, so these three things. Now, clearly, um, as, uh, as planners, we would probably feel a sense of ownership around the aesthetics uh, of a place. Um, uh, the problem is, is that uh, you know, as, uh, we have control over this. We may not be the designers, but we certainly frame the problem. We write the specs. We approve the plans. Um, and unfortunately, I think that also uh, we've been, you know, as planners, we've probably been beaten down by the bean counters and the risk managers who tell us that the extra landscaping is too expensive or that fun element that you want, maybe want to add uh, to a new building is an attractive nuisance and a potential loss. It's like, okay, uh, I get that. These are valid considerations. Um, but there is a cost to banality. There's a cost to indifference and a cost to ugliness. Um, and if our design and our planning decisions are actually turning people into indifferent, disengaged citizens, then there's absolutely a cost to this that we have to start factoring in to how we think and how we talk about uh, our cities. I think planners will need to take on roles that they have not previously uh, done. And in fact, you guys are going to have to wear some new hats. You're going to become community engineers, choice architects who have to influence uh, by subtle means rather than by prescription or by law. And I think you're going to have to become students of the human heart who engage our emotions as well as uh, our minds. Um, this is actually uh, the great challenge. And uh, I hope that maybe by framing the question, we start getting us to think about this a little bit more. So new roles for planners. Now, how many of you are actually trained in health or fitness? Yet I'm imagining that all of you have been asked to take part in your city's wellness agenda. You know, how do we create healthier citizens and things like that? Well, again, that it wasn't typically part of your job before. Aging in place. How many of you are geriatric specialists? Probably very few. The happiness of citizens. I'm sure that is being discussed as well, yet none of you probably have a psychology degree. And that's fine. Again, same thing with you know, economic development, talent attraction, retention strategies. Um, new roles as these community you know, engineers, choice architects, and societal planners. Now, I submit to you that maybe five or 10 years from now, um, it won't seem that 
unusual for you guys to be taking part in the discussion about happiness, sociology, and so, uh, excuse me, sociality, and this love agenda. Because five or ten years ago, you probably didn't think you had a place at the table regarding uh, wellness and things like that. These are, I think, are moving targets, and we're moving towards this. So this new role for planners. Now, part of this has to do with building the lovable city. Now, of course, at its, at its base, we have to create functional and safe cities. The problem becomes is when that becomes sort of the, the, the litmus test, and that is the only thing that we focus on. And certainly when budgets get tight, it is easy to sort of uh, fall into that particular trap of saying, okay, is it good enough? Then great, it's out the door. Um, but I think we can do better. We have to do better. We have to figure out ways to making our, our cities more comfortable, convivial, convivial in the sense of creating those social interactions, and interesting, interesting and fun. Now, why don't we aspire to those types of things? Um, and why, you know, it asks, it begs the question: Why can't our cities be comfortable, convivial, and fun? Now, part of I mentioned the happiness agenda, and I, I have to make a quick uh, mention about this because uh, this is Sigmund Freud, by the way. And uh, he had sort of a, a fairly negative view on this whole thing. He said happiness, or, or the pursuit of happiness, he called it a doomed quest. And he said that happiness is not included in the, the plan of creation. Um, instead, he said uh, we should aspire to a, a state of ordinary misery. Great. You know, uh, I'm sure that would sell really well in our city. It's like, well, we're going to aspire to a state of ordinary misery here in, uh, in Akron, Ohio, in St. Petersburg, Florida, wherever. Um, I think that, that, that happiness and love become these aspirational goals. Uh, for our cities. And it's even something that's being measured. Now, oddly enough, in England, David Cameron, under with the Tories, had actually instigated um, measuring happiness as a key metric. He calls it a general well-being and whatnot. Um, and they say that that which is measured gets done. Well, I'm suggesting that happiness and love are something we should maybe start thinking about. How do we measure? How do we quantify some of these things moving forward? And move beyond this idea of ordinary misery. Thanks, Sigmund. And let's, let's ask this idea here. What do we love and what do we hate about cities? This is a question I've been asking people for years now. And it's actually kind of fun uh, because uh, it, it, it makes people really think about uh, what they really care about within a place. And I can tell you this. What people tell me they hate about cities, they hate big things. They hate the transportation system. They hate the education system. Maybe the lack of green space, ugliness. Uh, they hate above ground wires. They hate bad parking. Um, they hate uh, things like pothole filled streets. Now, uh, I submit to you that we have to address these things. But the problem with addressing these kinds of things is we can spend a ton of money on trying to fix these things, but no one ever fell in love with the city because they fixed the parking. No one ever fell in love with the city because they fixed all the potholes. At best, what they're going to say is, well, you know, parking doesn't suck quite so bad. That's not love. Now, we have to address these things, but I, at the same time, we need to pay attention to what I call love notes. And these are these small, intimate little things uh, about cities that do resonate with us. It, I, I would equate these things to they're the cherry on top of the sundae, they're the chocolate on the pillow, uh, they're the, the heated floor in the really nice hotels, things like that. Um, those are the kinds of things that we respond to. And in cities, they can be maybe uh, a particular view, an old street, a, a festival, a comfortable park bench, uh, quirky little things that make you smile. So I want to maybe consider some of those and how do we create more love notes. So I've got some good examples that I'd like to share with you. Um, this is the new Curtis Hickson Park in downtown Tampa, right on the Hillsborough River. Now, the park itself costs, you know, some ten odd million dollars. Was part of a greater, uh, larger redevelopment, and it's wonderful. And I think it's it, it's great, and, and creating great, beautiful green space is very important. But I noted this: in one small paver uh, right near the waterfront, they actually added this, and they call it the marrying bench because just to the right of this, there's an, actually a bench and things like that where people can sit. Will you marry me? Now, it's one of those tiny little touches that most people wouldn't plan for or think about, but it's one of those things that if you see this, you remember it. And if you're one of those people who maybe actually uses this and maybe you have uh, uh, you, you ask your significant other to, to marry you there, you'll always remember Tampa, you'll always remember this place, and you'll always have a good feeling about it. And even if you just walk past it, even if you're not married or you're already married, it'll make you smile. Right along those same lines, the, the Tampa Museum of Art, great new building. Uh, Stanley Sadowitz design out of San Francisco. Uh, the building itself cost about $31 uh, million. Um, the city paid a little over $18 million of that. Um, but what they also did is they put a dog park in the back. They put a playground in the front. Now, I love the new museum, but I submit to you that for most people, these two little touches, the dog park and the, the playground, are probably more meaningful on a day-to-day -day basis and more of a reason to love the park and come down there. Yes, you may go inside and you see the great works of art and things like that.
but you're far more likely to want to bring your kids down or your dog and play down here. And that, to me, is one of those small little love notes that's easy to get overlooked and it's easy to get written off in the line items of budgets as we start moving forward and saying, what can we get rid of? And these are the kinds of things that unfortunately get sacrificed, but I believe they are the things that actually endure this cause to our, our city. Now here's a little example. Um, most cities have this problem, especially if they old, have older sewer systems, they have a combined sewer system and, and, and dumping is a problem. Well, the city of Lexington figured out, well, let's do a creative way to solve this and highlight the attention there. So they commissioned a painter to go out and paint the, the storm drains uh, in the city to bring attention so people won't dump there. And it's a small little thing, uh, uh, touch, it, it advances what the city's trying to do, but it creates this nice little moment when you look at that, hey, that's kind of cool. At least it makes you look, and again, it says, made you look, storm drain awareness, a love note. Another love note, DuPont Circle. In the grand scheme of, of Washington, D.C., DuPont Circle is a pretty small thing, but yet it's one of those sort of central kinds of things. It, it sits at the intersection of all of these major streets. The huge metro station there acts like a giant heart. It pumps people in, it pumps people out, and this is sort of the place to go if you're in Washington, D.C., to sit, to relax, enjoy the space, and to people watch, a love note. Another great example of that same idea, um, if you folks have been to uh, New York City uh, within the past year or so, you've seen pedestrian-friendly uh, Times Square. And it's a huge difference from what it was before. Before you went there, it felt like you were taking your, your life at risk if you walked around and tried to, to watch it, or people watch or look at the buildings. Uh, cars were everywhere. The, the sidewalks were packed. Well, what the, they did, uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Jeanette Sadek Khan is uh, the, uh, the head of transportation there, they, they, uh, they blocked it off. They made it into a pedestrian-friendly zone. And they even added chairs and Wi-Fi. So now it is a great place to sit. Not so much on this cold winter day when I was there last year, but you get the idea. Same thing in New York City, Highline Park. Now this was an elevated train uh, uh, line uh, down in the Meatpacking District in lower Manhattan. And it's about a mile and a half long. And what they did is they took this old structure that hadn't been used as a rail line for 30 odd years. And they turn it into green space, much needed green space for, the, for the, that part of the city. And it's wonderful. You walk along there, you see these sort of native plants that are sort of integrated in this unique sort of environment. Um, and it's beautiful. And it's one of those things that in the grand scheme of New York, yeah, it costs millions of dollars, certainly. But in the grand scheme of New York, it is, again, a very small thing. A little bit closer to home is here in uh, St. Petersburg, uh, where I live, is the Saturday morning market. And it's one of those typical farmer's markets that started out pretty modestly in 2002, but has since grown to the, actually the largest one-day uh, market in the southeast. On a Saturday morning, they will get 10,000 people will come through there, 120 vendors with hundreds more wanting to get in. And it's the place where St. Petersburg goes to sort of meet itself. And you see incredible uh, things, people walking their dogs, interacting with their neighbors. And again, it's a small little thing in the grand scheme of St. Petersburg. And this one is literally a love note. It's actually from uh, uh, Philadelphia, and you might have seen some of this stuff about these uh, love notes from this uh, artist by the name of Steve Powers. And he was actually a graffiti artist, and he worked with the Mural Arts Project up there. And they created this love letter project, these 50 murals uh, across like 50 different buildings that are really only visible or primarily visible on the train line as you sort of ride uh, to and from uh, in and out of the city. And it is sort of this, uh, uh, this love letter of this one person to another uh, about uh, their relationship. And it's a wonderful thing because clearly it's about the city as well. Hug me like I hug the block um, and things like that. Open your eyes, I see the sunrise. Again, it created a, a, an event here. Now every uh, Valentine's Day now they do what's called the love train where they bring people in and they do this sort of tour uh, of these uh, uh, these murals on this train that goes very slowly and whatnot. And actually this year they made national headlines because somebody actually got married uh, on the love train uh, this year. So a great sort of little investment love. Now, I want to also talk a little bit about some, uh, some things that make your cities lovable, but maybe not for the reasons you would typically think. Bike friendliness. Now, bike friendly to me means people friendly, because it's saying that, that not only cars are important, but people are important. And if you think about bike friendliness, uh, it says something pretty positive about uh, your community values if you're bike friendly. It means that you're green, it means that you're healthy, and it means that you actually have maybe a sense of fun. Because remember, bike riding is fun, or it should be fun. Another example, walkable cities. Um, of course, we know that you know part of that wellness agenda is trying to get our citizens to walk more. But walking is a form of courtship with your city. You can experience your city in a way uh, as you walk that is completely different from riding in your car. Um, it's also maybe the most democratic form of transportation. It, you know, the richest and the poorest you know, uh, among us walk the same sidewalks. That brings us together. And walking allows for discovery and improvisation in a way that uh, clearly being in a car doesn't. You can turn down a street. You can walk into a new shop. You can check out a new coffee shop. 
you may see those things while you're driving, but at 45 miles an hour, it's really a pain in the butt to try to pull over and maybe check that out. So walking and improvisation, pretty, you know, things about relationships. It's always great to discover new things. Now, 63% um, of U.S. households have pets. Now, only 46% actually have kids. And with respect to, you know, cats and birds and snakes and things like that, um, dogs are really the marker here because dogs require the largest accommodation of our lifestyle uh, and more resources than any other pets. We just don't walk our cats. And the great thing about dogs is that they actually create social experiences. They create vitality on the streets as we walk uh, uh, the streets. They are the eyes on the street that Jane Jacobs said uh, creates safety uh, out there. So this weird paradox is that dogs and cities make for a more human place. So how do we become maybe a more pet-friendly city? Places to sit and people watch. As you know, as primates, as so, we are social creatures. We are endlessly fascinated by watching each other. And if you can figure out ways to just accommodate people's desire to sit and people watch, you make for a, a happier, more lovable city. Play. Psychologists will tell us that play is an incredibly important part of our psychology. Um, and I submit to you that maybe how we play with our cities a lot of times manifest in public art. And this, of course, is Millennium Park and the, the cloud gate, the, 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 the great bean and whatnot. Um, the waterfall that kids love to play in during the, the summer months. It's uh, basically like a, a swimming pool for folks. And that's great. And I'm sure you're saying, well, that's fine, but show me one that doesn't cost $475 million. Like, okay, I hear you. Um, how about this one? This is called uh, the um, uh, Play Me on Yours. It started out this street piano project in Sheffield, England, and it sort of uh, grew from there. Uh, the idea that they put these pianos out on the streets and then the sign says, play me. And they encourage people to sit and come and, and, and bang out a tune or something like that. And what happens is people will gather around, especially if somebody's kind of talented. And the cost on this, almost nothing. Uh, yet the impact on it is quite, uh, could be quite nice, where you have a, a great experience, a communal experience, where you bring people together around that. Play. My quick public art test, by the way, is it fun? Does it invite you to touch it, climb on it, engage with it? Uh, I, I say even skateboard on it. We'll talk a little bit more about skateboarding here in a minute. Um, does it bring people together, and does it make people smile? If that's the litmus test for public art, then I think that's pretty good. Because it's a, lot of, a lot of times it's obviously pretty easy for pe people to second guess the utility of public art, but I think it's much harder to do that when your kids are playing on it and people seem to be enjoying it on a pretty visceral level. Now, uh, young love is also kind of an important aspect of cities. Um, and young love is one of those things that manifests in a couple of ways. Uh, what do young people love about cities? Well, it tends to be things like uh, like music scenes. Um, my friend Roger Schrantz and I have, uh, have talked about this you know, uh, many times. We, we talk about how these are underrated and undervalued assets, because this is what the young people in a city typically love. Um, live music venues and skate parks. And I know that you know uh, people look at skate, you know, skateboard parks as literally uh, just uh, uh, lawsuits waiting to happen, yet some cities have figured out how to do it, and the trick here is is that these are the things that express an openness to young people. Uh, um, we fall all over ourselves uh, to keep our young professionals, our young people here, once they graduate and they have degrees and skills that we need, um, but the problem is that their idea and their notion of the city has been fermenting long before we started paying attention to them, maybe in college. Um, and if we continue to say no to them for years, no to the live music venues, no to the skateboarding and things like that, it's really hard to get them to say yes when they're older and we really want them. So something to think about. And a quick note here about uh, Love Park and skateboarding. Uh, Love Park in Philadelphia is one of the world's great destinations for skateboarders. I don't know if you've known this, but since the 1980s, it is the place to go uh, and skate, uh, skateboard. It has even appeared in uh, video games and whatnot. But the city, uh, of course, doesn't like uh, skateboarding uh, and things like that. Yet they tried to figure out uh, a, a balance between the two where they, you know, skateboarding at certain times and certain places and things like that. And a California company even offered the city a million dollars uh, because they're a skateboard related company if, uh, to the city to support skateboarding in that way. The city turned it down. Um, I don't think the serendipity of, happen of becoming a world class uh, or world renowned city for a particular thing just happens easily. And I think Philadelphia is maybe turning its back uh, on something that could be uh, brought into the fold and valued in a slightly different way. Uh, but it's an interesting debate. Now, some things we also love about cities are rituals and traditions. Um, this is water fire in Rhode Island. And if you've ever been up there, it's this incredible uh, scene where they have, uh, I think, 120 of these braziers that sort of exist that, in the river that snakes through uh, downtown Providence. It was created in 1994 by artist Barnaby Jones. And it's, or excuse me, Barnaby Evans, Barnaby Jones, TV show. Um, 
and, and it's wonderful. It's primal. It's fire and water. And as you walk around the city at night when this is going on, you smell the, the pine smoke. Uh, you hear the crackle of wood. You see these the shadows dancing on the walls and things like that. It's amazing. I mean, how many of us have ever just sat and watched a fire? And a few years ago, I had uh, the opportunity to participate in what's called a, uh, a lighting ceremony where we carried these torches down from City Hall down to the waterfront and we lit these things. It was very, very cool. Something I always remember about uh, Providence. Um, Keeneland in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, I've heard this uh, race uh, place described as the Augusta National of, uh, of race uh, places for horses. And in April and October, they have their racing seasons, and it brings out the, the men in their suits, the women in their, their finest dresses, and, of course, their hats. And there's the whole city is awash in this sort of uh, gentility around uh, horse racing, uh, gambling, too. But it's a wonderful time to be in Lexington in, uh, in April and October. And it's something that everybody, locals and visitors, uh, look forward to every year. And here's a pretty fun one. Uh, this is actually a zombie walk in downtown Pittsburgh. Now you go, why is downtown Pittsburgh and zombies? What does that have to do with anything? Well, movie aficionados may know that George A. Romero's uh, Dawn of the Dead was filmed at the Monroeville Mall uh, in Pittsburgh. And that has become sort of the mecca uh, for zombie aficionados uh, around the world. And these zombie walks attract hundreds, if not thousands, of people. And they become these sort of you know, big-time events. I mean, you know, we, we want parades in our cities. Um, maybe we should start thinking about zombie walks and things like that. But it's an interesting example of uh, a, a tradition and a ritual that grew out of something kind of weird in pop culture uh, that happened to be a zombie movie. Now, here's the question. How do you know if it's love? And, you know, the immortal uh, David Coverdale of Whitesnake asks, is it love that I'm feeling? Well, that's a tough one because how do you know if it's love? We could look at these two and say, are they in love? And you go, well, they're kissing and things like that, maybe, uh, uh, and things like that. But the whole idea here, it's more of an anthropological experiment. How do you know if it's love? Well, you look at what people say. They say they're in love. You look what people do. They hold hands. They kiss and things like that. Um, behaviors, um, you know, they, they live together. They, you know things like that. We aggregate these and we make a judgment based upon those. It's sort of an anthropological experiment. At the same time, we maybe look for proxies of love. So I've tried to figure out some of the proxies for love and knowing if your city is maybe on the right path. And I asked the question, how do you hold hands with your city? And that's a pretty interesting one because it's a public display of affection. And what I came up with is this idea of these city-themed t-shirts. Now this is, I'm wearing a rubber city clothing t-shirt, Akron, where the weak are killed and eaten. Um, not really, but it's kind of fun. And these uh, sort of these niche retailers have arisen that created that really cater to locals, and they create these city T-shirts that are not sports related, that are not sort of trip tourist related, but they sort of are sort of the inside joke, as it were. And they, they're popping up all over the country. Uh, here's one from Detroit. They actually use funds from this particular one to uh, to fund other projects and things like that around in the city. Uh, STL Style uh, in St. Louis. Uh, these guys are great. I uh, uh, interviewed them for the book. Uh, here they are, Jeff and Randy Vines. They've actually opened up a store where they sell all kinds of Seattle, or excuse me, uh, St. Louis-related merchandise, and it's incredibly popular. This girl, Lauren Tom, opened up what's called Flirty Girl. And in the midst of a recession, she opened not one but two retail stores in New Orleans that cater to the folks who have this emotional connection with, through these T-shirts, through other kinds of uh, New Orleans-related material. Um, this is how you hold hands with your city. It's a public display of affection. How do you marry your city? Well, this is an interesting one because a tattoo, like marriage, is probably a near permanent connection. You can get out of both. They just can be kind of painful and expensive uh, to do so. Uh, but the Fleur de Lis is kind of funny because it's actually become a bit passe, uh, I'm told, by my friends in New Orleans because so many people have them. Um, I think this is an interesting one. This is my friend Dave uh, who actually got the, the Katrina Sid. The, the mark that the, the army put on the houses as they were uh, sort of uh, categorized, um, he tattooed that on his wrist. He will always remember uh, Katrina and where he was, and that he wanted to make that, uh, that marriage to his city. Um, here we have an Akron one. It's a double whammy because he's got not only that, an Akron tattoo and a T-shirt. Uh, this is the Roberto Clemente Bridge in Pittsburgh. I thought that was a pretty interesting declaration uh, of love. Uh, this is the Cleveland skyline. Uh, this is the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania. He's actually uh, got his um, uh, the, uh, the zip code for Braddock tattooed on his arm. After he won election, uh, uh, John Fetterman, in I think it was 2005, he won by one vote as the commitment to his city. He got this tattoo saying he's in for the long haul. So that, that's a marriage. But the queen of all this happens has to be uh, Katie O'Keefe, and she's from Cleveland. As you notice here on her arm, she's got the terminal tower and the Cleveland skyline going, and behind her ear, 
here. She's got the 216 uh, for the, uh, the Akron uh, area code. She's a web designer up there in Cleveland, and she came back after living in, I think it was New Jersey, and said she was in love with Cleveland, and she wanted to, to mark that. This is how you do it. Breaking up with your city actually happens, too. And I think this is actually an interesting one, because this, uh, there was a designer in L.A. who got a, a job offer in, uh, back in, I think it was New England, Boston, and moved back there. And uh, he had a public breakup with the, the city of Los Angeles. And he said, sorry, L.A., it's over. And he did, like, five different um, billboards around the city. I love you, L.A., I'm just not in love with you. And it's not you, L.A., it's me. And I think this is kind of interesting, because at least he's recognizing that he was actually in a relationship with our city. And I don't think this is actually is a bad thing. I think this is actually sort of a creative and a good-natured way uh, to go about this. And really what it was is a powerful reminder to all of us, or to all those in L.A., that you are, you are actually in a relationship with your city. You just may not think about it that way. Now, a few other things. How do we measure love? Uh, a friend of mine from Savannah, Georgia, uh, named Chris Miller, came up with what he called the Google Love Hate Index. And this is not a scientific kind of thing, but it is actually a lot of fun. He took the idea, he says, I love Savannah, Georgia, I hate Savannah, Georgia. And he put those two together and, and searched in Google, which is the closest thing we have to a sort of collective consciousness, and he got some interesting results. And then he applied it to other cities. Um, and you see that the loves to hates actually sort of maybe mirrors how you might think about certain places. Chicago does well, Atlanta not so well, and of course he was at the time, he was comparing Savannah to Atlanta uh, and things like that. Detroit challenged, of course, Cleveland as well. Um, St. Petersburg does pretty well uh, on this. I thought that was kind of interesting. A lot of people love the bird here. Um, and smaller cities like Paducah does phenomenally well. Akron does well, uh, things like that. Sort of traditional cities like Portland and, and whatnot. Is this scientific? No, but there's something about it that kind of feels right. Because you know, when you put so much data into Google and it's looking at all of these kinds of things, um, it's really hard to fool uh, Google like this with a PR stunt or something like that. Um, so there is some validity to this. Maybe it's something worth at least considering tracking over time. Now, of course, you can like things on Facebook. I'm sure most of you probably are in cities and you've created, had to create a Facebook page for your city, and you want to know how many people like it. Well, that's a fairly simple way to, to do this. And you hopefully uh, you get people out there and they're actually pressing the like button uh, and whatnot. And do you have a plan? Are you tracking this over time? I think you should because it actually does matter. Because this whole idea of social media is really far more important, I think, than a lot of people have, have discussed in the past. And I want to talk a little bit about this in depth. Robert Putnam wrote Bowling Alone, where he sort of uh, created the idea of social capital, that our connections with each other are, are important, that have value. And a lot of people have decried the internet as sort of the death of social capital. They say, we have friends on Facebook instead of having real friends. Well, some of the, the studies are coming out now in this sort of area they call neuroscience, or excuse me, neuroeconomics, which is this combination of economics, psychology, biology, and neuroscience. They took a, a measure, they had people tweet, and they measured the levels of oxytocin in their brain, which is, the, this, uh, oxytocin is what they call the cuddle uh, hormone. And it's uh, generated between like uh, people, and it's sort of known for uh, like mothers and their newborn children, sort of how, how we bond and things like that. So these, these neuroscientists measured the levels of oxytocin uh, between sort of face-to-face -face contact and social media-based contact. And it found that when people used social media, uh, their brains interpreted tweeting in the experiment was like interacting with people they actually knew and they cared about. So this e-connection thing is actually pretty important. Now, I, I clearly understand that if you're, you know, to you know, our grandparents, if you're 65 years old, this may not be nearly as meaningful to you as if it is a 15-year-old, and I get that. But there is something there that says that social media connections are social capital building. So we need to be tracking this and paying attention to this over time, especially as these younger, younger people who come into uh, these city-making roles, these community-building roles, and they're immersed in social media. Um, we may not be as interested or, or, or you know, we're not Facebooking, we're not tweeting at the same uh, rate, but we got to pay attention to this because that's where the next generation already is and they're coming into their own and whatnot. I look at things like social media volume per capita as a measure of, uh, of cities' vitality. I think that's something kind of interesting. Maybe you track that over time. You can do that uh, with Facebook and their advertising tool. They, they, they call it reach, just as, you know, you uh, how, what's the reach of your local newspaper or a magazine? Well, Facebook can tell you that as well. Um, food and love are two 
incredibly important things. And if there's anybody here from Pittsburgh, you immediately know what this is. It's called a fermenti. Um, it's sort of a famous sandwich from the Fermanti brothers. It's basically a hamburger uh, with its French fries, uh, coleslaw, and toppings all put together on this sandwich. And the whole idea here was this was trucker food. Uh, and guys, they could take it and they could uh, eat it sort of on the road quickly and, and, and easily and whatnot. Is it the healthiest thing in the world? No, but it's really pretty darn good. Um, what are the, the local food things that uh, uh, your city uh, is famed for and resonates with? So that's something that we absolutely love about our cities is the local food. Um, sustaining love. When we love something, we want it to be healthy. We want it to last a long time. And so I looked at how do we uh, measure that, and I came up with a sort of green love uh, measure. And there's lots of cities that are trying to figure out how to, be, to measure green. And this is a, I, I, call it, I would say it's a blunt instrument, but it is indicative of something. I looked at the number of LEED certified projects per capita and measured that. And it was kind of surprising because most of us would not think of Grand Rapids, Michigan as being sort of the greenest city in America. Yet based upon the number of LEED certified projects to the population, it's huge. And especially compared to some of the traditional uh, green powerhouses that we think of, you know, San Francisco, uh, Chicago, Portland and things like that, they do well, but they don't do nearly as well as Grand Rapids. I think this awareness of having all these green projects and these green uh, things out there in the community creates this sense of green love and a, the sense of sustaining the community in a way that are visible and persistent reminders of our commitment to our environment. And that's why I think it's kind of an interesting and important marker. Um, same kind of thing with giving back. I looked at the number of grant makers per capita. Um, this doesn't necessarily look at the, 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 the amount of money, per se, because that obviously privileges certain older communities do very, very well here. I mean, the Cleveland Foundation, I think, is the second largest foundation in the, in the country, I mean, with billions of dollars in assets um, and things like that. But it did look at grant makers because I thought that giving back and sort of that altruistic sort of relationship that we have with our community, the number of grant makers in the community, that kind of felt like it was a, a relevant number. So we looked at that as well. So in the few minutes that we're going to have here, and I'm sure you're asking, OK, how do we start? How do we move people um, into these directions? How do we you know, start thinking and acting on this notion that this, this emotional connection actually might be uh, kind of important? Well, I want to go back to that continuum of engagement. And I want to say that the, I think one of the key points here is this, is curiosity. That stage from neutral to being curious about your environment is maybe the most important one. Uh, because once you start being curious, you are at least starting to move in that, uh, that right direction. Uh, it's as simple as wanting to see what's down the street or behind this door. Hey, what would happen if we did this? With a curious mind, other things become possible. Because we're not going to move people from being angry or detached to being in a committed or in a loving uh, relationship with their city overnight. No, it has to be sort of this pace and sort of purposeful process that moves people in that particular direction. So I want to ask us as planners, what barriers to curiosity have we maybe inadvertently erected um, in our cities? And this may or may not apply to your city, but uh, these are some things that I've heard from folks. You know, admission fees. You know, we have a lot of these public institutions and things like that, art museums and things like that. And I understand the need for having um, admission fees because it helps to pay the bills. But are we, you know, by charging that, are we deferring, are we encouraging people not to come in if it's, you know, a couple bucks, if it's 10 bucks, if it's more? Um, are they not experiencing something that might endear them to the, the city? Parking, obviously, is always going to be an issue. Um, and it's not that parking has to be right in front of a building, but it, it, people have to know, make, know it's predictable, that at least they know that you know, when they come to a place, they can park somewhere and they can get to someplace else that they need. Something fundamental like bathrooms. Um, having good public bathrooms uh, is a way to ease people into the idea of coming back downtown. Maybe they didn't, you know, uh, come downtown for a number of years and it's like, okay, where can I park? Uh, where can I uh, go to the bathroom? Where can I sit when I want to be comfortable? Um, the idea of closed doors. A lot, oftentimes we'll insist on bars and things like that closing doors because we want, uh, because we're afraid of the noise. Okay, okay, I get that. But closed doors don't let us see what's happening in there. It's a barrier to our curiosity. And when we see other people having fun, we're far more likely to have fun ourselves. One-way streets. This is a huge bugaboo for cities. You know, one-way streets basically live in service of moving car from point A to point B in the most quick and efficient manner. But it doesn't allow us to do those things that I was talking about. It doesn't allow for improvisation. It doesn't slow traffic down enough that we can look around, we can see what's happening, that the car and the and pedestrians can exist, you know, in sort of a, a more friendly and a more uh, equitable manner and things like that. And needless regulation, and I've got a good example here from Clearwater, Florida. 
um, there's a local sign ordinance, which I'm sure good and well-intentioned, but the way it's interpreted, it actually prevents um, artists who have studio space uh, from actually putting their artwork out in front of the studio space where people could actually see it. Finding that balance between regulation, which I'm sure there's an, there's an important point to that, and you know, uh, balancing out the need uh, for encouraging this sort of curiosity and things like that. So I want to go back here to this particular point because I want to say this is important, that the people who make things happen, how do we find more of them? Because, again, they're going, to they're going to step into this gap. They're going to create the environment. They're going to create those things that we consume. They're going to create these things that make lovable communities uh, over and above uh, us as official makers. Remember these folks? How do we find more of those? And I've come up with what I call the one-tenth of one percent solution. And I equate this to the idea of spices. You don't need a lot of the most powerful spices. You need just the, the right kinds. And maybe it's not the same one. It's a little of this, it's a dash of that. But you need just a little bit of that extra flavoring that makes the, the zest, that makes the great dish. So you need, of course, you know, your stock, your vegetables, your meats, and things like that. That's great. But you need a little bit of the most powerful spices in the right uh, sort of percentages. Now, if we go back to this idea about 1% uh, making a community, uh, I use St. Petersburg and Tampa here as an example. Uh, population of St. Pete is about 245,000. Um, population of Tampa, 343,000. That means about 2,400 people and 3,400 people are responsible for creating the experience of the city that are, is St. Petersburg and Tampa. What would happen if we added one-tenth of 1% 1 of those co-creators to the mix? Think about the exponential impact that 245 or 344 people might have in these cities. If we, create, if we found 245 more Bob Devin Joneses, what a great impact that would have in our community. And I call this sort of the new math of talent attraction and retention. Because what we're talking about here is the way we think about the problem. The way we think about the problem has been in the past, we cast a wide net. Um, and when we had resources, we could do this. That's great. Um, the challenge right now is we don't have those same resources. We don't have this big net that we can throw um, at, at particular problems. And this one-tenth of one percent solution applies not only to the people, but I think it applies to those love notes and, again, those little things that we are talking about, those small, uh, intimate things that don't necessarily cost a lot of money. And it's how we think about the problem is got to change. So instead of the, the net casting, I think we need to start thinking like spear fishermen. Spear fishermen, it's a very different process. It requires patience, it requires a bit of skill, and knowing when to strike and going after the right kind of fish. The challenge here, and I'm sure that all of you have been, have, have been hearing this, you hear the phrase, you got to do more with less. And I find that incredibly problematic because it's wrong, and we all know that that's not really sustainable. Um, what we're talking about um, is having more of an impact in spite of having fewer traditional resources, more of an impact. Not doing more, more of an impact. Um, that requires creativity, it requires innovation, it requires this new resource pool and new players and participants at the table. Now, little things in this uh, scenario, like the love notes, they really do matter. Emotionally engaged citizens really matter, and we're recognizing that we are in a relationship with our city, it matters. Um, you guys, as, as planners, you probably have to take a leadership position in this area because you guys, again, you set the frame, you set the tone, you are the professionals in the room who are talking about managing those critical resources that, that we know are traditional, yet you're going to have to figure out how to add these spices that are these new players, these new resources to the, this particular mix. Love matters because it's going to take more than just the profit motive to build the communities that we desire, and it is now everybody's job to help spread and maximize the love. And it's 2 o'clock. I hope that is uh, something for you guys to chew on. I would love to have any follow-up conversations and questions now. If you've got something you'd like to email me, I uh, we'll definitely will uh, answer your questions. Uh, but I think it's important to get in front of you guys uh, as planners because, again, I think you are in an incredible position to lead in this particular area and make some amazing things happen uh, with our city. So thank you very much. And, Jennifer, I will happily answer any questions you guys have. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much. And I apologize earlier for our audio difficulty, but I'm glad we were able to get it resolved. All right, we have a comment here from John. He says, regarding your references to skateboarding, the city of Portland has become the skate park, 
uh, skateboard park mecca of the world. Is there any evidence that this has been anything but great for the city? I doubt it. I suspect it's been very great for the city. Are there any studies out there that support the construction of skate parks as a positive thing? I don't know of any specific studies, and most of the, the kind of things uh, are far more anecdotal. Uh, people try it, and they have a good experience, they have a bad experience and whatnot. I think it's got to be something that is done, it's like, any, it's like anything. You can add public art, you can try this, you can try that. A skate park is, is an experiment. You know, if it's done right, if it's put in you know, the right spot, if the right rules are put around it, if it's well designed, if it's done within the context of an overall plan, I think it's a wonderful thing. And it sounds like Portland has figured out how to balance the interest of a skate park uh, with the interest of, you know, the people who, you know, want to walk their dogs and who want to, you know, they have their kids out there uh, and things like that. It's all about finding the right sort of balance. Um, I do know that Philadelphia, despite the fact that they have uh, issues with Love Park, um, has been doing a lot of stuff around this. I met some designers, uh, some, uh, some planners and uh, uh, landscape designers who specifically work in the area around uh, Philadelphia. So if you're looking for maybe some uh, information around that particular issue, I suspect that Philadelphia, and I, I, if you email me with that particular question, I will see if I can dig up the contacts that I have up there regarding that. But again, I think the point is, is that uh, it's got to be done in the greater context and figure out how to balance it with other kinds of stuff. But I'm a big fan of, of the skate park, the, the low pants hanging kind of stuff. I don't get it, but they seem to like it, and I think it's important for our city. Okay, great. Heidi has a question about how has the availability and quality of public transportation factored into which cities seems to, seem to have more love? I think that's an incredibly important one. I mean, nobody loves getting stuck in traffic, right? Um, cities that have figured out ways to help get you out of your car and make you less car dependent, I think, are definitely going to uh, be cities uh, that endear you more. I mean, maybe you like, you know, again, maybe you do like uh, being in your um, but most of us don't, and in fact, uh, Robert Putnam found that uh, if we increase our uh, average commute by 10% over the average, we actually decrease our quality of life by a corresponding 10%. That was an astounding figure that he threw out in Bowling Alone. Uh, but it sort of makes us think, yes, how can we, you know, how can we get out of our car? Because we're isolated in our cars. It's not just the time and the frustration of driving, it's the fact that Almost all of us are driving alone. We're listening to the radio, we're maybe on the phone, <laughs> we're maybe texting, which we really shouldn't do, uh, things like that. We're just not connecting with other human beings when we're in the car. So, of course, we're going to be happier. Anytime uh, we can actually uh, interact with other people, um, and even if it's sitting on a bus or a subway uh, train together, there is still something social about that. We feel that we are actually connected with our, our fellow citizens in a way that cars simply don't let us. And I will make one interesting note about uh, public transportation. Of all the 50 major metros in the United States, all but one now have either some sort of uh, light rail uh, system, either in progress, in, in action, or in planning. The only one that doesn't is Tampa Bay. Uh, we actually struck down a, uh, a penny sales increase uh, in Hillsborough County over in Tampa. Uh, in November that would have uh, facilitated the beginning of a light rail uh, project. So we're actually the only major metro in the United States that does not have any form of light rail, uh, even in planning and whatnot. And that, I, I hear this all the time, especially from the young professionals in this area, that they bemoan the fact that they don't like having to drive and they really, really want public transportation. Okay, great. So Richard wants to know, how do you convince developers to include or municipalities to require the spice? Uh, it's a good one. Um, some of them mandate it. Um, the city of Clearwater actually, uh, in one of the more progressive things that they did, despite that silly sign ordinance that I referenced, um, about three years ago they created a 1% um, a public art uh, requirement for all development over, I think, a minimum of, a, I forget the exact minimum, but um, it required 1% of the cost of the project to be uh, to include some sort of uh, uh, public art component. And that could be design features that were created by artists and things like that. It doesn't obviously have to be the statue that sits out in front of the lawn and things like that. But the arguments that we did to, to create uh, that, they, all kinds of studies show that public art actually increases, obviously, um, things like the absorption rate, um, that things that are well-designed and sort of beautiful and aesthetic, um, they get sold faster. 
um, even in this, you know, obviously challenging uh, economy, you know, you make that argument. So um, on the one hand, you can sort of force folks to do that, uh, like uh, Clearwater did. And by the way, that was both public and private development, which is what made that particular ordinance pretty progressive. Lots of places will do public uh, development, you know, we'll have to include that. Um, I think the market will sort of, uh, will help to, to bear that out. And I'm sure that the, the smart developers that I know, um, my friend uh, Phil Hollebeck is a developer in downtown Lexington. And he was putting, he's not required to put public art or great design in any of the stuff he does, but he absolutely lives by it. He swears by the fact that that makes a difference. And, and as a competitive you know, developer, he wants his stuff to sell more and faster than his, uh, his uh, competitors. So he knows that that spice is actually what, you know, the cost is sort of incidental uh, to the overall thing, but it actually pays off for him in the long run. So I think the, de I think the wise ones already get that. But maybe we as planners, we help nudge them along the way by encouraging that with maybe little things like you know, those incentives and, 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 and laws and things like that. That's the question. All right. So Jacqueline wants to know, as a planner in a city that lost 10% of its population in the last 10 years, what suggestions do you have for engaging diverse populations and the mainstream? Diversity, not homogeneity, makes cities interesting and exciting places. Absolutely. Um, there's a, I write about Braddock, Pennsylvania in the book, and you guys may have heard of Braddock, and you've probably seen some of the ads on TV and whatnot. But Braddock is a satellite of Pittsburgh that's lost 90% of its population in the last uh, generation or so. Uh, they're down to like less than 3,000 people and whatnot. Um, so yeah, losing population is a huge issue. In fact, most cities are you know, losing uh, population as well. The, I think the trick is, is that you can't rely on one particular thing. It's, um, you know, go back to that continuum of engagement. Um, there's not, not everybody's going to be interested in the same things, and we tend to focus on sort of like the mega project. And I did show, obviously, Millennium Park. And Millennium Park has, you know, its successes, but it also has its uh, uh, critics because a lot of cities become enamored with the idea of creating like one great big thing, the mega project and things like that. And, and Millennium Park is always held up as the great shining example of that. Well, a lot of those mega projects tend to fail. Um, but the, it's a lot easier to get political will and resources behind those kinds of big things because we sort of understand that. I, I think it's much harder for us to uh, to make the argument that we should be doing, instead of one big thing, we should be doing a hundred, a thousand little things um, and spreading out those little kinds of opportunities and letting people figure out what they do love uh, about their community. And I think by doing that, if we, if we move away from you know, those big sort of centralized, you know, ideas and to this idea of proliferating lots of ideas and, and encouraging people to go out and create and become participants in, in their community, those people are going to come up with the interesting stuff. Um, and I think it's just a mindset of encouraging those, if you will, those small fires versus the one big bonfire, which is easy to become fascinated with. Okay, great. So Douglas wants to know, generally and proportionally, do Europeans or any other non-U.S. residents love their cities more than the people in the U.S. love their cities, and why? Well, that's a good question, and I purposefully did not comment. Uh, I've been to, you know, uh, to Europe, and I've, I, I spent a summer there in 2009 working on the project, and I've spent a good deal of time in the U.K., uh, uh, in Ireland, uh, and things like that, and I just didn't feel confident enough not because you write about what you know. And if you don't really live there and you're not immersed with it, um, it's, it's a different kind of conversation. I suspect every place has people. I know that every place has people that love it. I think that um, the European relationship with their cities is a little bit different. It certainly has far more history, um, and it goes much further back, where you, know, you see cities that are hundreds if not thousands of years old. You see buildings, the same kind of thing, streets, that you know, once you know, Roman chariots rode down, but now you know, uh, Subarus roll down. There's a different feeling about that, and I think that the the European sensibility and the relationship with their city is clearly influenced by that. And I just, as an American, I just didn't feel like I could wrap my own head around that. So I, I sort of make the excuse in the book that um, I'm writing primarily about uh, American cities, well, North American cities. I do talk about uh, Toronto. But I think there is something about that longevity and that history that does color the European relationship with their cities in a different way. Um, I'm not saying it's better. I'm not saying it's, uh, you know, it's worse. But I think it, it clearly is a big difference uh, between the two. Maybe, maybe the next book. That'd be great. Great. 
Todd wants to know about crime. You haven't touched on crime very much. I think it's one of the major factors that cause people to hate cities. Do you agree? Any experience with reducing crime to increase the love? Yeah. Um, it goes back to that, uh, remember the pyramid that I showed you about functional and safe? You've got to, you know, you've got to you know, meet most of those markers. You can't just move to the interesting and the convivial and the fun and all that stuff without covering your basics. So certainly there is that. But I had this interesting conversation with uh, some friends of mine in Detroit, and they all say, you know, Detroit is not a safe city. Um, and, and people get robbed in Detroit. A friend of mine says, yeah, if you live here two, three years, expect your car to get broken into at some point. Expect to get mugged. It's, it happens. But what was interesting about the folks who are sort of in that, in Detroit for the long haul, the ones who love it, it didn't matter to them. Um, that there was that the countervailing things about the city that it, it held them despite the crime. So I, I think that the trick is, is yes, crime is important, and I, I don't really touch on it in the book. I'm, I'm writing more about sort of on the other side, but I certainly you know do uh, touch on it in the sense that your basics have to be covered, and crime is part of that that basic sort of infrastructure. But every city has crime, and to, to some ex extent. Certain places are obviously a little bit more the Wild West. But if a, the Wild West you know, uh, thing doesn't deter some folks, or a lot of folks in Detroit, but the other interesting stuff compels them to stay, then I think people are far more likely to forgive the unfortunate thing of getting their car broken into or getting mugged or something like that. Um, I think the trick is, is to pay attention to the crime, Try to your best to take care of it, but that can't be the only thing because you know you could make the safest city in the world, and I guarantee you it would not be lovable. You know, so it's finding that balance, like paying attention to that, but doing the other things, the things that will, you know, the the one joy that will dispel a thousand worries uh, on the other side. So make more of the love, and I think people will, you know, will forgive the occasional uh, spike in crime or something like that. It's a tough one though. So Heather wants to know what your favorite love note is that you've seen, something in a city that you think is great. A favorite love note. That's a good one. Um, maybe it's because I live here, but the one that I think is so important, and I've seen it revitalize the city of St. Petersburg, is that silly Saturday morning market. Uh, thing. And I remember when it started almost 10 years ago, it was on like one block, and you probably had two, three dozen vendors, and it looked kind of sad. Um, but it, it was an excuse. People started coming out. The quality of the vendors gets a little bit better. The food, you know, the foods and things like that. And it became something that, you know, you went down there every Saturday morning just because you wanted to see, you know, who else was down there. Your friends started to show up down there and things like that. And it was this little tiny thing. And the city had to make uh, some small accommodations to allow uh, for the, the zoning and the permitting, you know, blocking off the street at one point. Now it's actually held in the parking lot of the minor league baseball stadium here in downtown St. Pete. But it's amazing to think that how small that started. Again, you know, a couple dozen vendors, maybe, you know, 100 people or so the first time, to 10,000 people on a typical Saturday morning will come down there. And it is, the, and people will drive from all over, you know, Tampa Bay to come down here. And then we'll spend a day. And, you know, not, and, and those little things have allowed other stuff to happen. There's a new Salvador Dali Museum here. Uh, there's a Chihuly collection uh, of glass works and things like that. But I think that those things are even made more successful by this little tiny uh, excuse to come downtown, interact where other people meet. And I'm, I know I'm being a complete homer on that, but I, I do love that one. And I have to say I love the, uh, the idea of the, um, the love notes or the love letter project in Philadelphia. It's one of those things that it's a visible and persistent reminder as you're riding in and out of the, the city, if you're walking the streets and things like that, you see those murals. And it's an amazing expression. Uh, of, of art and creativity and fun, and I guarantee you it makes people uh, smile when they, when they walk past it. So I, I'm going to go with those two. Great. And we had a question about where to find those city-themed t-shirts that you had talked about. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, kind of fun. Um, if you go to my website, I've got a, a link there to a library of images and things like that. There's a bunch of other photos, but rubbercityclothing.com is the one for Akron. Um, Flirty Girl. It's flirtygirl.net is the one in uh, New Orleans. Also, Dirty Coast in New Orleans, dirtycoast.com, stl-style.com, um, CLE Clothing in Cleveland. And uh, I mean, just do a search for you know city t-shirts, vintage, things like that. You'll find it. 
but it's one of those things. It's like you know, there's all kinds of places making tourist-related T-shirts, but in some of these other cities, and think about the cities I just mentioned: Akron, Cleveland, Detroit, um, St. Louis, and New Orleans. Those are all sort of challenging places. Um, I know there's all kinds of T-shirts for New York and San Francisco and things like that, but it's these little entrepreneurs who recognize that there is a uh, there's there's something about wanting to, to be in this relationship and loving your city, that they've created pretty successful little cottage industries around these simple t-shirts. Um, but yeah, check out rubbercityclothing.com. I, I love that stuff. Again, being a homer, I'm an uh, uh, Akron boy, born and raised. Okay. And Douglas wants to know, are cities that attract more tourists necessarily more lovable? That is, uh, that's a great question because it's always a balance between the two because um, a city like um, Savannah, Georgia is it's an incredibly beautiful city, but so many of the locals there, who I, I have friends there, I spent some time up there, um, they, they have this sort of love-hate relationship with the tourists because the tourists come and they sort of they crowd out the locals. And, you know, and, and the, granted, the, there's the local scene and then there's the tourist scene, and there are places where they overlap and things like that. But part of the challenge is to, is to, you know, to maximize the authentic, and a lot of times our, our tourist stuff is not very authentic. Um, I live in a tourist state. Florida is all about you know, you know, bringing in tourists, and we sort of have that same love-hate relationship you know, with tourists as well. I mean, the tourists come, and that's one of the reasons why there's no state income tax you know, here in Florida. Um, so you've got to respect that. Uh, but the trick is finding that balance. Um, I, I think the, the interesting thing here is that too much of our orientation, especially in Florida, has always been trying to, to satisfy the tourists. I think if we flip that around and we said, look, what is going to be interesting um, and engaging for the locals, the tourists will love that. If you make it something that the locals love, I guarantee you that the tourists are going to want to come and see that because they want to see, they want to have that experience. They want to go to a place and say, hey, what's it really like to be here in, you know, in Chicago, in Austin, in St. Petersburg? Where do the locals go? Where do the locals eat? Nobody's clamoring to go and you know eat at the local Outback Steakhouse. And I, I say this in the book: nobody ever fell in love with you know the you know a place because the local Outback had the best food. And I like Outback, but it's one of those things that doesn't make for an authentic sort of. Um, experience as it were. So I think if we switched it around and we focused on creating great stuff for the locals, the tourists will absolutely follow. Okay. Deb wants to know, how do you convince officials to balance making art touchable, climbable, with potential risk exposure and liabilities? Yeah. It's the, the bloody risk managers of the world have created, you know, uh, places where, um, you know, they, they want to take all of the, the risk, and I think in taking the risk, you take certainly a lot of the fun uh, out of a place. Um, I think it's got to change the conversation from uh, no to yes if. Yes, you can build the, uh, uh, the statue that allows for skateboarding and, and climbing and, and whatnot if you do this, this, and this to help mitigate that. It's not like, and I'm actually a lawyer by training uh, years ago. I call myself a recovering attorney. Um, so take this with a, a huge grain of salt and whatnot, and it's not an official sort of legal opinion, but it is referencing back to that. If you don't, you're not responsible for getting rid of all risk. You just have to address it in sort of a reasonable way. Um, yet I think that the risk managers of the world are so afraid of even the, the, the whiff of a lawsuit that a lot of times it goes much further. Um, I, I think then in, in situations like this, it's best to actually point to other places that figured out how to do it. How did they do something? How did they get you know, the city's blanket coverage around this to allow for that particular skate park, to allow for that particular jungle gym, to allow for that uh, bungee jumping bridge, something or other, and whatnot? Uh, then I think it's, it's easier for, you know, uh, for the risk manager to say, well, if somebody else did it, then I'm a little more likely to sign off on it. So I guess the, the trick is, is to, to get them to, you know, to recognize that you can't you know, get rid of all the risk. Um, and then I guess you guys as the planners and as the city managers and things like that, you can find other places that actually pulled something like that off. And so the risk managers know they're not the first one in the pool. They're going to be far more comfortable with that. Okay, and Jason wants to know, what did you think about the Detroit commercial that aired during the Super Bowl? I loved it. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. I thought that was more, that was the one commercial, and in fact, a lot of friends, um, uh, people talked about that. That's the one commercial people really remembered, isn't it? Um, 
I thought it was brilliant. And in fact, it, I thought it was more of, a, of an ad for the city of Detroit than it really was for Chrysler. Yeah, of course, Chrysler's mentioned in there. But that was one of those things that, that absolutely touched on a, on a vital nerve in the American psyche, you know, where it says, you know, this is not uh, uh, New York City, it's not the Emerald City, it's not Sin City, this is the Motor City. That's at the core of the American identity are, are cities like, like Detroit, like Pittsburgh, like Cleveland, where we made stuff. You know, now, you know, uh, the cities are obviously, you know, uh, in, in challenging states and whatnot. But we respond to those cities in a very sort of visceral and primal way. And as goes Detroit, so goes, I think, the American spirit. And I write a lot about this in, in, in the book. Because I think Detroit is an important market. Detroit and New Orleans. Clearly two cities that are incredibly challenged. But if they fail, I think it says something about us as a country far beyond the failures of two municipalities. It says that we can't get stuff done anymore. It says that we can't in reinvent ourselves. That we are not uh, the great country that we once were. So I think everybody is rooting for cities like New Orleans, and certainly I think people are rooting for Detroit. And that ad absolutely caught the zeitgeist of that. The people want to see Detroit succeed because they know that if Detroit can succeed, their own cities can succeed as well. Well, great, Peter. Thank you so much for joining us today. For those on the call, we will be uh, ending today's webcast, and you can complete the evaluation form that will pop up on your screen as you're leaving today's session. Peter, thanks so much for joining us and talking to us about your new book. I'm sure we will look forward to reading more. My pleasure. Thank you all. Good Thank luck. you. Peter, I will follow up via email with you. Sounds great. Thanks. Oh, thanks.